Well, good morning. morning. Y'all are cheaters. You came to the second service today. You slept in. No, I'm just kind of good work getting to church on Daylight Savings Time. Um, My name is Adam Darbo, and I'm one of the pastors here. Really glad to have you here. I'd like to start this morning with a little trivia question. Uh, Who is the highest paid person on TV? Now, I'm looking at 2016 statistics. 2017 statistics are a little harder to come by, but who's the highest paid person on TV? Any guesses? Oprah. Oprah. Nope. Nope. The answer, the correct answer is Judge Judy, <laughs> believe it or not. Yes, I see some celebrating. Yes. Judge Judy at an annual salary of $47 million per year. Yes. Judge Judy delivers justice to her faithful daytime TV audience and has for 22 years. Can you believe that? She has been on TV for 22 years. And you might wonder, how in the world has Judge Judy been this successful? Right? And there's surely a lot of reasons. If you talk to some of her fans, though, which I have, uh, you will inevitably find out, and they'll tell you that they love Judge, Judge Judy because of her tough questions, her quick wit, her no-nonsense attitude. Right? Judge Judy never backs down from a fight. She never loses a fight, and she always fights with style that is refreshingly incongruous with her shapeless black robe. Right? <laughs> See, Judge Judy delivers justice, which we love her for, but she also delivers justice in the way we like justice delivered, right? With some swag, <laughs> right? And here's the deal. We live in a world that is, that is desperate for justice, don't we? I mean, I, I believe this is actually the reason for the rise in popularity of superhero movies over the last decade or so. Right? We, we are obsessed with justice because while our perspective from our comfortable American armchair shielded us for a while from the harsher realities of injustice in our world, the rise of social media and globalism has forced our collective conscience to come to grips with reality. And the reality is there is great and terrible injustice in our world. Massive injustices, small injustices, injustices everywhere in between, from school shootings to gender inequality to racism, sexual harassment, refugees being driven from their home, corruption, human trafficking, human rights violations, biological weapons, violence in general. And I could go on and on and on and on, right? I missed a few. Some of you have got some in mind. Injustice is everywhere. It's pervasive. And we've become well acquainted with the fact that the constraints of our innocent until proven guilty legal legal system, though better than most, is woefully inept at bringing full justice, real justice. And we're beginning to realize that no amount of activism or argumentation on Facebook is going to bring about that justice in our world. We've discovered that the at least I've discovered this. I, I think that you probably have too. We've discovered that the scope and measure of injustice in our world outpaces even our human capacity to care about it all, much less to do something about it. Right? And so we have to, we do this thing where we have to pick which justice issues we're going to care about and spend our emotional energy on because we can't on all of them. And so our hearts may bleed for all of these injustices, but eventually we bleed out. And the good news we're going to find this morning is in our text. We're in Matthew chapter 12, and and this morning we find out some good news that Jesus delivers justice. Jesus delivers justice. Now, of course, though, in keeping in true Jesus fashion that we've come to know and love as we've worked our way through the book of Matthew. Jesus delivers justice differently than you or I might expect. Jesus doesn't deliver justice like Judge Judy. There's no swag, there's no pomp and circumstance to it, but he delivers the justice we so desperately desire, that we so desperately need, a justice that even Judge Judy or anyone else can't give us. Jesus delivers justice differently. That's what I want you to walk away with this morning. If you have a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 12 with me. We're going to start in verse 15 today. 
If you don't have a Bible, don't worry, the the words will be on the screen. But we're going to see today how Jesus delivers justice and why his method for delivering justice is good news for you and for me and for a world that is filled with injustice. If you'll remember with me from last week, Jesus has been going around. He's been healing people, going ar- and, and he's even been healing people on the Sabbath. And the Jewish leaders aren't real happy about this. And so they are so caught up in their own rules and their own status that the text that we read last week ended by saying that the Pharisees went out and they plotted how they might try to kill Jesus. So our text this morning picks up in verse 15. 15 right there. And it says this, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Now, some of you are going that, that is a good idea, right? That's a good idea. That's exactly what I do when I am, when someone wants to kill me, I get out of there. I go to a mountain, I go away, right? (laughs) And we're going to see this a few times with Jesus. I mean, this is kind of a pattern with Jesus that when he's challenged like this, when uh, people are plotting to kill him, he withdraws. But see, others of you are maybe more like me, and you read this and you're thinking, Jesus, what are you doing? Right? Like, Jesus is the king. He's got angel, armies of angels at his, at his beck and call. I mean, these guys can't touch him until he and the Father say they can, right? Why is he letting these Pharisees chase him out of the city, right? Why? The question that I think our text begs right away is, why does Jesus withdraw? And not only that, but let's keep reading in, verse, uh, in verses 15 and 16. It says this, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. And then continues, a large crowd followed him, and he healed all that were ill. And then he warned them not to tell others about him. So Jesus gets away. A bunch of people follow him. He's healing everyone and that comes to him. And all, the, all these people are getting healed. And Jesus is bringing God's restoration on earth. God's kingdom is coming a little bit. It's peaking through, breaking through with each sick or leprous or diseased or broken person that comes to him and walks away healed. And so you can imagine the frenzy, the excitement, the crowd in that place. And Jesus tells everyone, okay, great, but don't tell anyone. And actually, the text says that he warned them not to tell anyone. The the Greek word for warned is actually an even stronger word. It means rebuked. He rebuked them not to tell anyone. I mean, can you imagine? Imagine with me for a moment. You're sick. You've been sick for a long time. You're You're in constant pain. You've got open sores on your body. No one will come near you. No one will talk to you. No one will hang out with you. You aren't allowed to go to parties. You've been ashamed and in pain for a long time. And then you hear about this guy named Jesus. And so you go and check him out, and he's teaching, and the stuff he says sounds really good. In fact, it sounds like things, no, no one ever speaks like this. And then the sick person, not so unlike you, walks up to him, and Jesus says something. You can't quite hear what Jesus says, but instantly their disease goes away. And then another sick person walks up. And then another, and the same thing happens. And you've been to every doctor, and you've done every treatment, and nothing has worked. And But you're watching person after person after person after person walk up to Jesus and be healed. And so you finally get up the courage to hope one more time that maybe this guy would be different. Maybe this guy really could heal you. And so you walk up to him, and and he asks you, what do you want me to do for you? And you say, I just, I want to be well. And he reaches out his hand and he puts it on your shoulder and he says, you are healed. And no one's one's put their hand on your shoulder in years. But he says, you are healed. And like that, the pain goes away. And you look down at your arms and the sores that were there are gone. And and you, you can hardly believe it. And everyone, and the, the crowd, that's there, everyone's clapping and cheering and excited. And you're filled with more hope than you've had in years. And so you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you. And as you turn, you turn to start to go into the arms of the cheering crowd of other people who used to be sick and now are well. And now you're one of them and you're going to join them. And as you start to turn, Jesus says, hang on a second. And you go, yeah, what? Anything, Jesus. He says, don't tell anyone what I did. You're like, what? What? Wait, wait, hang on. Just what? No, no, no. Just don't, don't tell anyone. 
But I mean, Jesus, come on, people, people are going to ask. Like I have friends, I got family, I got co- people are going to ask. I've been sick for a long time. People are going to ask. I know. Don't tell anyone. Okay, but Jesus, listen. Maybe you don't understand Jesus. Let me explain it to you. I was sick. Now I'm healed. People, ha- people have to know about this, right? I, like I have to tell people that. Don't tell anyone. No, no, no. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Sorry. Let me try to put it in better term. Jesus, you don't understand. You're amazing. No one does this. Like you're powerful. No one else can do this. We've never seen anything like this before. How can I, we have to tell you, everyone has to know this. Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Right? What in the world is going on here? I mean, why is Jesus hiding who he is and what he's doing? Why is he withdrawing when he could fight? Why isn't he letting people get the word out? I mean, doesn't he know that word of mouth is the best kind of PR? And fortunately for you and me, Matthew's going to spend the rest of our section this morning explaining why Jesus does this. And uh, and to do it, he's going to quote from the Old Testament. He's going to quote from a passage from Isaiah 42. It's actually, if you guys have been following along in Matthew, you know Matthew loves to quote from the Old Testament. He's just Old Testament happy. He's got it in verses all over the place. But this is actually the longest sustained Old Testament quotation in the whole book of Matthew. And it's from Isaiah 42. And it comes down to this. I mean, this is kind of the big idea that, that Matthew's pulling out for us. It's that Jesus delivers justice differently. And specifically, this quotation from Matthew gives us three aspects of justice, of the justice that Jesus delivers that are different. And so first, it shows us that Jesus delivers God's justice. The authority to deliver justice comes from all sorts of places, right? So Judge Judy, the authority to deliver justice comes from the U.S. government. Believe it or not, she's a real, no kidding judge, like by the U.S. government. So she gets her authority from the U.S. government, Other people get their authority from elsewhere. Like Batman gets his authority from the people of Gotham and the chief of police of Gotham, right? Like you get your authority to do justice from different places. Jesus gets his authority from God. Look at verses 17 and 18 with me. It says this. This was spoken, uh, this was to fulfill, that is, everything that Jesus has said or that has happened in verses 15 and 16. So his withdrawing, his healing, and then his warning people and rebuking people not to tell about the healing he's done. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. The quotation from Isaiah comes out of a part of Isaiah that Bible students call the servant song. So this is a section in Isaiah, a relatively large section in Isaiah, where Isaiah pictures the coming Messiah, this king who's going who's gonna to come back and restore Israel and the world as a servant of God. And so Matthew applies this terminology to Jesus, and he says Jesus is the servant that God has chosen to dole out his justice. The servant whom he loves and in whom he delights. I like The Greek is actually even more beautiful. It says, my beloved in whom my soul delights. And if this language sounds familiar to you, it's because we've read it before. We've read it before in in. the the baptism of Jesus back in Matthew chapter 3. God says almost the exact same thing to Jesus. And we're going to read it again in in a couple of chapters here when Jesus goes up onto a mountain and his glory is transfigured for a brief time. God says something very similar to Jesus. And at Jesus' baptism, when God says this to him, what happens next is that the Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. So it comes out of the sky like a dove. And the next line in our prophecy that we read today is, I will put my Spirit on him, and he'll proclaim justice to the nation. And this is important because look at, did you notice who has done everything in our text so far? Right? It's God. God has done everything in our text so far. God has chosen Jesus God loves Jesus. God delights in Jesus. God places his spirit on Jesus. It isn't until the last line of verse 18 that where a shift happens and we start to hear about what Jesus is going to do. And it, this is what it says. It says, he will proclaim justice to the nations. 
See, Jesus delivers justice differently than you or I or anyone else. It isn't the justice of governments or of a particular nation or a particular legal system that Jesus proclaims. It isn't the justice of the masses or the collective will that Jesus announces. It's the justice of God. And you see, when God created the world and he put everything in it, and at the very beginning, there was justice. Everything was as it was supposed to be. And when, but when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin entered the world and it brought injustice with it, And so it didn't take long for people to start manipulating each other and murdering each other. And then it just kind of spun out of control after that. So much so that what we read is that God decided, okay, I'm going to take the most righteous people, only the most, like the cream of the crop, the most righteous people I can find, the only righteous people I can find. I'm going to put them in an ark and I'm going to destroy everything else. I'm going to send this massive flood and get rid of all the unrighteous people. And I don't know if you've ever thought about, like I have, I've definitely thought this, and I wonder if you've thought this too, where you've thought like, if we could just get rid of all the bad people in the world, right? All the inju- unjust people, the terrible rulers, the like we, let's just, like if we could just some, figure out some way to like kill them all off, then like all of us good people, and of course that's us, right? Uh, <laughs> all of us good people, we like, we would be left and then there wouldn't be injustice in the world anymore. And whenever I think that or I hear someone say that, I just think that's so naive. God did that. Like a long, God did that a long time ago. That'll never work. Anyway, that's sort of a tangent. But God, so God did that and it didn't work, right? I mean, it, the ark was open for a few hours before injustice, justice faltered, right? And we've been living in this broken and unjust world ever since. And God is on a mission to bring justice to this world filled with injustice. And God isn't thinking about fixing a few justice issues. See, I, I, we tend to break up, when we think about justice, we tend to break up justice into, into different issues or different cases. And, and, and then we like argue with each other, right? Like I get really passionate about this kind of justice or this justice in this area, arena of the world where there's injustice. And then you get really, really passionate about this, but then you don't like me and we get, we get in a fight because my justice is more important than your justice. And it gets kind of, it gets, gets sort of ridiculous fast, but it happens because the scope of injustice in our world is so large And we realize we can't fix everything all at once. So we have to make these decisions like which justice issue is more important than the other, which is a terrible choice to have to make. And it it becomes, we get to this place where it sounds silly to talk about a world in which there's complete justice, full justice. And so instead we just focus on a particular case or a particular issue or a series of particular cases and particular issues. And that's fine. But God doesn't have the same constraints that you and I have. And so when God talks about justice, and when the Bible talks about justice, almost all the time, he's talking about, not about a specific issue or a case, not even about simply like like a bigger idea, like the end of violence in the world. He's talking about, God is talking about bringing, when he talks about bringing justice to the nation, he's talking about a holistic, complete, full restoration. He's talking about remaking all, all that is wrong in the world and broken in the world and making all things right again. And so our passage this morning teaches us that Jesus was sent to do just that. And that's why this passage comes in the context of Jesus' healing ministry. Because disease and, and, and sickness is part of the injustice of the world. It's part of the brokenness that exists that isn't right. It's part of what God is making right in the world again. And so Jesus is the one, he's the only one who can deliver God's justice, which is what we really actually need. Jesus delivers justice differently because he delivers God's justice, full justice, complete justice. Jesus also, though, second, delivers justice differently because he delivers justice quietly. He delivers justice quietly. We expect and we even like our justice to come out louder. Right? We, one of the reasons we love Judge Judy and she's so popular is because, and she's so fun to watch is because she fights with defendants. Right? They come in and they argue and she argues back and they start shouting and she shouts louder. And because she's smarter and more experienced and more powerful than anyone in that courtroom, basically, she always wins. And this is, this is how we like our justice delivered. Right? We want to say we want to shout it at people. 
when, we, when the injustice happens, we, right? We want to post it all over. We love the sound of that gavel coming down, right? When justice is proclaimed, we want that, we want that gavel to slam as hard as possible, right? We want our justice to be loud, but that's not how Jesus delivers his justice, not according to our text. It says that Jesus delivers justice quietly. Read with me verse 19. He says, it says this, he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. See, Jesus isn't like Judge Judy. Even though he could win, he doesn't fight with those who try to argue against him. In fact, one of the things Jesus is actually known for, once you read a lot of, uh, a lot of stories about Jesus, is he's known for not arguing. Right? Over and over again in the Gospels, we read about how the Pharisees and Jewish leaders and all kinds of people come trying to trick Jesus and test Jesus and argue with Jesus. And even though Jesus could answer all those questions, and surely he could school the Pharisees on theology, being God and all, right? Just, but he doesn't. What does he always do? Almost always he just asks another question of them. They ask him a question, he just responds with a question. And so no matter how hard the Pharisees try to antagonize him, Jesus refuses to enter into a shouting match with them, even though he could totally embarrass them if he did. He would totally win, but he isn't going to quarrel and cry out. He tries to explain, like just in the previous passage, he tries to explain how it's okay to heal someone on the Sabbath, but when they refuse to get it and they continue to fight him, he just withdraws. He's too busy actually doing the work of justice to continue to fight about whether or not it's okay for him to do. These these people are never going to get it. And so Jesus withdraws quietly and he keeps on healing people, presumably, by the way, on the same day, the Sabbath. There's no break in the text. And so it isn't that Jesus never says anything, though, right? Because after all, it's, uh, the, our text this morning says the Spirit is on him to proclaim justice. Assume, uh, we can assume that's going to involve some speaking, but rather the text says that no one hears his voice in the streets. Not that he's not talking. He's been telling people about God's justice. He's been proclaiming the coming kingdom of God, but no one is listening. So the evidence is there. He's told the truth, but if people won't listen, he's not going to yell and scream and argue and try to persuade people. He knows what he came to do, and he's just going to keep on doing it. It's a little bit like if you ran into Kevin Durant on the street and you didn't know who he was. He's just like some tall, super lanky dude. And... Uh, and you got talking with him, and he said, uh, he said, you know, I, I came here to bring another championship to the Golden State Warriors. And by the way, if you're not a Golden State fan, you're going to hate this illustration because, spoiler, the, the championship for Golden State is synonymous with the kingdom of God in this illustration. So I realize there's issues with that. <laughs> I do, but just bear with me for a moment. <laughs> So you see Kevin Durant, you're talking to him. He says, I, I came here to bring a championship to Golden State. And, but you not knowing who he is, you're not convinced. And so, um, so he pulls out a basketball. I assume Kevin Durant just has like a basketball in his pocket all the time. He pulls out a basketball. There's conveniently a hoop right there. And he throws this like massive windmill dunk just down. I mean, the, it's just this massive thing. Meanwhile, there's other people gathering around, people who know who he is. They're like, oh, that's Kevin Durant. They're taking pictures with him. But imagine with me, you're still not convinced. Imagine you, if you went, you know, I, there was a guy on my high school basketball team that could dunk too. Like, that, you know, that doesn't mean anything. Who, you could be anybody, you know, you could be anybody. The question I have for you is, what do you think Katie's reaction would be in that situation? Now, I don't know, I don't know the guy. I don't want to presume to know the guy. But if I was him, here's what my reaction would be. My reaction would be, dude, I'm a big deal. Okay, I'm like one of the best basketball players on the planet. And, and I've got more important things to do than prove myself to you. I showed you some stuff. And if you don't believe me, I'm okay with that. I'm going to go back to practice now, and I'm going to go hang out with Steph, and we're going to do cool stuff, and you're not going to be there. Right? <laughs> that's, I, that's how I would react. But that's how it is with Jesus a little bit. Jesus has been doing this stuff, but he delivers his justice quietly. His actions kind of speak for himself. He's not going to argue and shout and and try to convince you forever. And this has big implications, I think. It has a couple implications. 
if you're not a Christian, we're going to get to us Christians here in a moment, but if you're not a Christian, this has big implications for you because you can argue and fight and demand signs from Jesus all you want. And Jesus is gracious and he will illuminate to you and he will, um, and, and he will illuminate truth to you and he will tell you things and put you in position to hear truth, but he's not going to fight with you and he's not going to try to outshout you. It's not that he's silent, but if you're talking and you're fighting and shouting too much to hear his voice, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. And at some point, either you got to hear his words and believe him or you miss it. And here's the thing. He's just going to keep doing the work of justice and restoration in the world that he was doing before you came along. He doesn't need you. You need him. So whether you're able, whether you believe he's able to do it or not, he's going to just keep doing that work. And, here's, and here, if you are a Christian, so those of you who are a Christian, here's your application. Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. Okay, Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. All right, some of you are nodding along. I'm not sure if you, if you got this. See, when your friend posts something unfair about Jesus on Facebook, Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. Okay, when Christianity is losing political influence, Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. Okay, when you hear someone at work make some unfair comment about Jesus, Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. He's doing just fine. Right? See, something weird happened to us Christians at some point where we, we got confused along the way. We read these stories about Jesus and we saw that Jesus didn't fight back and we assumed that it was because he couldn't fight back. And so he needs, he, what he needs is he needs some soldiers in his army to get behind him and stand behind him and fight for him and, and speak up for him. And, and that's just not true. Right? Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. If Jesus wanted political power, he could have told all the people that he healed. And that, on that day, just go tell everyone, right? He could have gotten the masses on his side. He could have gotten political power. If Jesus wanted to correct your friend's theology on Facebook, he could just, he could like do something cool, like lock your, like lock your friend's screen on some Bible website. It doesn't matter how damn good he is at coding, right? Like he can't get it off. It's just frozen. He's got to read it. Like Jesus could figure it out, you know? He doesn't need you to argue. You know what happened to Peter when Peter tried to fight for Jesus? You guys read this story before? Peter, the fisherman, who's got a sword for some reason, but he's, but he's a fisherman, right? So he tries to cut some guy's head off, but he's a fisherman, and so he misses completely, gets the guy's ear. Like, close, probably scary for the guy, but not really as effective, right? So the ear, the guy's ear comes off, it's bleeding. What does Jesus do? Jesus says, stop it, man. He, gra- and he grabs the bloody ear off, he puts it back on, like Mr. Potato Head or something. Like... <laughs> Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. He's just fine on his own. Right? You know, do you know what happens, by the way, at, at the end of the Bible and in, in Revelation, when Jesus comes back, Jesus, Jesus comes back, he's got this white horse, he's the warrior Jesus, all the armies of God line up behind him. You know what happens? Jesus says one word. All the armies of God are wearing these white cloaks that don't get dirty or bloody at all because they don't do anything. Jesus doesn't need you to fight. He doesn't need anyone to fight for him. He's just fine on his own. And so when people misunderstand and mistreat and slander Jesus, we act surprised. Like our whole faith isn't based on the fact that one time in human history, people mistreated and slandered and misunderstood who Jesus was. That's our whole faith. That's how our faith happened. And Jesus told us as his followers that how to behave when we go out now announcing the kingdom of God. He, he said that, that we're going to, if we align ourselves with the kingdom and we align ourselves with him, we're going to get mistreated and misunderstood and slandered. And, we, and yet we get surprised when it happens and we fight back. But Jesus told his followers how he, they we're supposed to behave when people do this, right? When we go out announcing the kingdom of God, when he sends his disciples out, what does he say? He says, when someone mistreats you, when they won't let you into their home, when they, when they exclude you, right? Shake off the dust, shake the dust off your shoes and go to the next house. You don't have to outshout them. You don't have to fight. Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. Jesus delivers justice quietly. He just goes about his business. He just does what he came to do. Right? So third, Jesus delivers justice compassionately. 
delivers it quietly. He also delivers it compassionately. Justice and compassion might seem like odd concepts to pair together, by the way, but look at what Matthew does and Isaiah does in verse 20. He says this, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. Um, Reeds were used for measuring or for support, and so if you've ever seen a bruised reed before, what happens is, you know, something hits it or whatever, and, and even if it doesn't chop all the way through, it'll bruise it. And so it turns kind of uh, green or brown, and it, gets, it starts to kind of rot a little bit, and, gets, and, and then it won't stand up straight. It folds over wherever it's bruised. It won't hold straight any longer. So you can't measure anything with it any longer. You can't support anything with it any longer. And a smoldering wick pictures something similar. It's a candle whose wick has gotten too short, that it's nearly drowning in the wax. And so there's maybe still an ember on it, but it doesn't give off light any longer, and so it's outlived its usefulness. And both of these items are used up, broken, and past their prime. They once were useful, but now they ought to be discarded because they no longer serve their purpose. Uh, My parents went to San Luis Obispo a couple years ago where my grandfather lived at the time, and, uh, and they were visiting him, and... My grandfather's in his 80s and aging and, and just kind of all of the issues of trying to live on his own as an aging man. And so my parents went down to help him and to do some cleaning. And as they're cleaning, my, parent, or my grandparents are notorious pack rats. And so as they're cleaning, my dad found a pair of scissors on the desk that were just totally broken, just normal cutting, uh, paper cutting scissors, right? And they're, they're just broken sitting on the desk. And so he goes to throw them away. And my grandpa says, Wait, 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 don't, don't throw those away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix those. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix those. And my dad, who's trying to like clean out the house, right, get things in order, it's like, okay, that, we'll buy you a new pair of scissors. Actually, there's four other pairs of scissors in the house, which, and how many pairs of scissors does an 82-year-old man need? I'm not sure. There's four other pairs of scissors in the house, and we'll buy you another, like, $3 at Walmart. It's going to, like, let me just throw these away. And and, but he insisted that, no, I'm going to fix those scissors. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix them. Don't throw them away. And as he, the more he ins- insisted, he started to lament that this younger generation just doesn't understand that just because something is old and broken and, and used up and, like, and it's not useful like it used to be doesn't mean it should be disposed of. Now, I don't know if he's right about the scissors. The scissors probably just needed to go and probably use their life. But I think he spoke some truth that day, right? Because as goods and have become increasingly disposable in our society, it has rewired our brains to believe that if something is not useful, it should be thrown out. And that's totally fine when we're talking about scissors. But the problem is, is that in our sinfulness, we apply that principle to everything in our life including people. And we do it without even realizing. It's not like we're doing this on purpose, but without even realizing it, we apply it to people, to friends and to spouses and to coworkers and to all kinds of people, people we meet at the grocery store. And so, but that's not how Jesus operates. Jesus won't break a bruised reed and toss it aside. He won't snuff out those who aren't lighting up the room like they used to. Jesus is compassionate Jesus looks at them and says, don't throw those people away. I can fix them. And see, this is good news because you and I are also broken reeds. On your own, you aren't providing anything useful to Jesus. All right, some of you need to hear that this morning. You forgot that Jesus didn't save you because you were smart or successful or rich or moral or because you just have this charming, wonderful personality that everyone loves. Jesus didn't save you because of that. Jesus saved you because you were a broken reed who had lost its ability to fulfill its purpose. And he could fix that. Some of you this morning, though, you know you're that broken reed. Maybe you walked in here really hurting. You know you're that smoldering wick. You're at your wit's end. You feel worthless and useless and not valuable. You realize that you fall short and that your own sinfulness consumes you. But hold your head up this morning. Jesus doesn't break bruised reeds. He doesn't snuff out smoldering wicks. And when he brings justice, he does so compassionately. 
He is the hope of the nations and the hope of all who are broken. We need justice in our world. We, and Jesus delivers justice differently, different than Judge Judy, different than you or I, different than we even would have expected. Jesus delivers God's justice. He delivers justice quietly, and he delivers justice compassionately. And, here, and here's the thing, though. When anyone delivers justice in our world, what we find, whether it's Judge Judy or anyone else, they usually deliver what I call consolation justice. Consolation justice. Injustice has been done, and Judge Judy comes, down, comes in, and she lays the hammer, and she punishes the perpetrator, which makes the defendant feel a little bit better but it doesn't erase the wrong that was done. This kind of injustice consoles the victim, but it can't restore the victim. Not really, not fully. But the problem with this kind of of justice is that it's good, but it's just not good enough. Right? It's that it's always reactionary justice. It always deals with the symptom of the issue and not the real issue because the real issue is actually not out there. It's in here. The human heart is crooked and prone to injustice. It's not just those bad people, the criminals and the malcontents. It's not just them. No, no, no. It's you and me too. There's something built in and broken that is prone towards injustice in us. And so the problem Here's the real problem. With the, the problem with desiring justice, if you really want to get serious about desiring justice and really contemplate and look introspectively into these things, you'll find at some point that you too are the one to whom justice must come. Right? You too are the guilty one who deserves justice. And so Jesus, the Jesus didn't come to deliver consolation justice. Jesus came to deliver what I call victorious justice. Justice. Jesus knows what the real problem is, and so he came to fix it. And so he got off the judge's bench, and he became the defendant instead, and he suffered injustice, great injustice. And he did so compassionately, so that even when he was nailed unfairly to the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he suffered injustice quietly. And so though with a word, he could have had all the angels in heaven come to his defense. He stayed silent so that you could cry to God and God would hear you. He suffered injustice by submitting himself to the justice of God, though it was you who should have been on that cross. And because he did, God's justice was satisfied. And so now you can stand before the judgment seat of God without fear. It is by suffering injustice that Jesus brings justice through to victory, as our text says. That every bruised reed and smoldering wick and weary and burdened person, everyone who is downcast and broken might hope in the compassionate, unassuming, divine justice of Jesus Christ. Jesus delivers justice differently. And when you look, so when you look out on a world that is full of injustice, and then you look in on your own heart that is full of injustice, you can hope again that Jesus can restore it. He can bring justice. So hope in that this morning. Let's pray. Father, you are a just God, and yet you are compassionate and loving and full of grace. And so we throw ourselves at your mercy. We throw ourselves at the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that he suffered injustice on our behalf so that we could come before you, so that you could look on us, so that you could fix us and restore us, bring justice in our hearts. Lord, we beg you to bring justice in our world and in our hearts. The world is broken and it is far beyond anything we could do to fix it. And so, Lord, we pray, would you do that? Would you bring justice? As your word says, would you let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream? We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.